Well, good morning. So today, what we want to engage in conversation with you about is how new disruptors are entering the, the healthcare provision market. Um, as many of you know, hospitals and health systems for decades have been working to improve the customer experience. Um, but on many occasions, we're still seen as hard to access or difficult to access or difficult to maneuver. So coming out of the pandemic, we have seen retailers, um, insurance companies, tech companies um, seizing the moment and identifying that, that friction in the customer experience and, and looking into how they can then become part of the healthcare market. So you see Amazon, Walmart, CVS, Walgreens, other tech companies coming into this market. And we have several panelists with us today who are in markets that are experiencing that change in dynamic. That new dynamic is really going to force health systems like ours to jet propel the improvement in the customer experience. So today I'm joined by Tina Fries Decker, who is president and CEO of Cor Corwell Health, which is the result of bringing together two of Michigan's best and finest health systems, Spectrum and Beaumont, into a $14.7 billion enterprise. Tina is also a member of the AHA Board of Trustees. Dr. J. Stephen Jones is president and CEO of Anova Health System. Anova is North Virginia's leading nonprofit health care provider, and Anova provides more than 2 million patient visits every year. And on the far end is Terika Richardson, who is Chief Operating Officer of Ardent Health Services. Through its subsidiaries, Ardent owns 30 hospitals and 200 sites of care in six states. Ardent is headquartered in Brentwood, Tennessee. Terika is also a member of the AHA Board of Trustees. So I'm going to ask each of our panelists, if they would, we'll go down the line and just spend a couple of minutes giving you an overview of their organization, um, but for them to also discuss um, their approach currently to what, how they're addressing the consumer experience. So we'll start with Tina. Thank you, John. So a pleasure to be here today. At our organization, Corwell Health, we are relentlessly pursuing better health. And we have a really ambitious and bold vision to ensure that health is simple, affordable, equitable, and exceptional as we move forward. We are the combination, like John said, of two healthcare organizations coming together to serve Michigan um, that cover uh, 22 hospitals right now, 300 outpatient sites. We have about 60,000 people that um, are part of our system that take care of our communities. But we also have a health plan that serves 1.3 million members we're the third largest provider-sponsored health plan in the country. And so one of the things we really focus on as part of our consumer experience is how do we make it seamless for the people that are both our health plan members and our patients to ensure that care is integrated and that they don't have any issues with navigating or accessing or paying for the services that we offer. So that's a big component of who we are as an integrated health system. As we think about um, our consumer experience journey and our approach and our philosophy for it, we really believe that the experience is everyone's responsibility within our organization. And so we've really focused on um, a couple things. First is our culture, because we want to make sure that our culture enables people to do what they do best every single day, and that we give them the training and the tools to help them provide an exceptional experience for the people we serve, whether it's in care or it's in coverage. We also want to make sure that we simplify the process. We know healthcare is complex, and that complexity isn't going to change, but we can reduce the complicatedness. And so we're focusing on simple and trying to get to ease, whether it's an in-person visit or a digital experience that we have there. And then understanding the personalization piece of it. We know that people want us to know who they are and what's going on because that's, that's healthcare. And so we have this big emphasis on personalization. But it really starts with all of our team members and the volunteers that come in every day to really make sure that it is our job and we have the responsibility and accountability to uh, propel it forward, to be simple, to be personalized, and to embed that trust that the community has with us in everything we do every single day. Thank you, Stephen. 
Yeah, so Nova Health Systems in the uh, greater Washington area, the northern Virginia suburbs of uh, Washington, D.C., were five hospitals, probably less than a third of the size of Tina's organization. But many of the things that you heard her talk about are exactly the same things we're focusing on. We would, I would start actually with foundationally delivering exceptional clinical care is our core business. And so we um, focus very hard on quality, safety, and patient experience. And when we say safety, not just traditional safety from medical error, but safety in the workplace, psychological safety, uh, it's, it's a core part of the, of the work we do. <clears throat> Tina mentioned Seamless, and if I had anything that I would get every uh, Innova team member to, and we focus on, we call ourselves team members, not employees, because of the concept of team, to focus on would be Seamless. And that word comprises, I think, uh, or at least covers a lot of the issues we'd wanna make sure that we do, is that patients get uh, coordinated care, easily into us, readily accessible however they want it, personalized, uh, and, and by that, uh, when people used to talk about personalized medicine, it was all about genomics and, and you know, uh, specific molecules. When we look at personalized medicine, it matters who are we and what matters most to us. That's the second kind of principle we push our team members on is what matters most to the patients. And by the way, what matters most to us as team members. And then uh, the last part I'll add for Nova is that we've now got our core business down pretty tight. We run an exceptional clinical care. I, would, uh, I came from Cleveland Clinic. I actually ended up in Nova because I was confident in the clinical care that I would get. What we didn't have is making that easy, making it one system and one, and one team. So we're now trying to solidify that, including that digital transformation is now not off to the side. In fact, I, I tell our team, we will not have a digital transformation. We will transform Hey, John, we will transform and, and we will be um, uh, digital will be absolutely core to that transformation, but it will not be separate from our transformation. Okay, Terika. Now I'm really understanding why we're all on this panel together. We all have the same sort of mantras going. <laughs> Once again, it's grateful to, great to be with you all, Terika Richardson, the Chief Operating Officer with RH Health. And we're 30 hospitals across the United States. We operate out of six different states. and 23,000 team members across the enterprise. Um, I will tell you, we're focusing a lot on the, the frictionless environment, that is our terms, uh, to ensure that patients who come to us, families that come to us, have the same ease of use as they would in any other aspect of their lives. And we have worked really, really hard to do something that we've called getting rid of the paper rid of the uh, charts, the paper charts and paper in general. So we're trying to be a completely digital environment that extends not just in the four walls of the hospital, but also in the ambulatory environment and at home. And so that Art and Health Services is someone that will wrap their arms around their community, their patients, uh, and at every stage of the necessary journey and the continuum of care. So a lot of work uh, still to do. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but once again, treating patients the way that they want to be treated versus how we have historically done it as incumbents uh, is our goal and our mission, and we are 100% committed to getting there. So I'm going to go back to Terica with a question. Um, Arden Health Services um, provides services in multiple states across the country, east to west. And so they are a system that is already experiencing this evolution of disruptors coming into the healthcare market in, in different ways. And so I, I want you to talk a minute about how that's evolved and, and the impact you think it's having on you and your business as well as your community. Sure. As mentioned, you know, so many uh, disruptors have entered into the, to the markets that we serve. Uh, disruptors from the perspective of point solutions, whether that be a company only focusing on providing MRIs and CTs in a strip mall, to uh, providers who are looking at subset of populations and patients and managing that full continuum of care for them. And, you know, as we look across our Every new entrant has a different flavor, but it's all the same common DNA. And that is taking a component of what we do and ultimately providing this niche solution that is a point solution that does not ultimately allow for the continuum of care of that patient to be addressed. So a, a lot of focus that we have put upon our teams and upon our markets is to think through as the incumbent, 
Uh, we have said oftentimes we've built it, they will come. <laughs> and it has worked out that way in many regards. But the, the healthcare uh, patient of the future is really thinking about convenience and they're thinking about people caring for them. And how can we, as the incumbent, make that happen in a more seamless way? So uh, thinking through all of these key components and with disruptors, we're, we're trying to figure out, do we partner with them? Do we build our own? Do we buy it? But most importantly, how do we deliver that same type of convenience, maybe not in the strip mall, <laughs> but certainly in the places that is most uh, accessible for them? Great, thank you. Either of you wanna add on to that? I think the one thing that um, I think about with other, other disruptors is that they have a healthy dissatisfaction with the status quo. And so we need to make sure we have a healthy dissatisfaction with the status quo so that we can continue to innovate and take some of the lessons that they have um, taught us and embrace them. Yeah. And the other part, when I think of disruptors, often I think of the term disaggregators as well. Mm -hmm. And rarely do I have patients tell us that they want their care to be more disaggregated. So, <laughs> so, so we want to figure out how as a system, and I don't mean just a health system, capital H and S, as a system, meet all the needs of, of our patients, our consumers, if you will, at any given point in their journey. So that leads to another question I'm gonna to go to Tina on, which is can we as traditional care providers learn from their successes and failures um, and what, what do we learn from these healthcare retailers? And in your mind, what do you think the gaps are in their business model? Yeah, so I think there's a couple things that we can learn a lot from, from these other players. The first one is data. They are excellent at consumer data and putting that into uh, use and using it through analytics. Um, when you think about the retail uh, areas for health, they understand the, the enormous volume in pharmacy. Uh, now some have health insurers, so they get even more from the claims information. They understand shopping patterns. They understand um, travel and convenience and geolocation. So I think that we as healthcare organizations need to do a much better job in understanding the power of data and then re really grapple with how do we use that information um, to still... Uh, ensure trust with our people uh, that we're serving every single day, but we need to understand that piece of it. I think the second thing that they really have focused on is loyalty with their um, consumers and their customers. And they've done that because it's seamless, it's easy access, it's convenient for them, and they have some loyalty programs. What do we do? How are we convenient? How are we easy? Um, do we have programs that en enable them to always go to one place versus going to a number of different places? Um, and then the third area that I think they're really strong at, and many, especially that have health and um, insurance plans with them, are focused on cost. And they want to be the low-cost provider. And they're going to be pushing that low-cost provider out there, whether they're going to really focus on value-based care and try to uh, uh, focus on the prevention piece and, and understanding the um, for their upstream processes and control the whole thing, they're gonna really emphasize cost. You see that in a number of places. They put their pricing on their wall. It's very simple. And so it's easy to understand. When you look at our organizations, it's not easy. Now we do really complex uh, surgeries and things like that, but how do we make it easier? How, are, how can we be more transparent with the information about pricing? I think um, there was a study that said 89% of people want an easier to understand bill. I don't know what the 11% wanted, <laughs> but, they lied. but it's clearly this is a big issue that people need to understand the healthcare pricing and they want to understand what's on the bill and what they're, what they're going to be charged for. I think the area that uh, we do a much better job of compared to the retail organizations is the outcomes that you mentioned. So we really emphasize the care outcomes and what we're doing every single day. And I don't think that's understood or standard yet in the retailers and what they have. And I think we pay a lot of attention to the safety pieces, the, um, the connections about what may happen to somebody in that whole life cycle for a person and how do we really take care of their health. And with that, I think we ha still have a whole lot more trust of consumers, and we need to make sure we maintain that trust. In one of our internal studies, you can see there is still a differential of the people that trust our health care organization versus the trust that other disruptors. 
And I think that's because we have the competence, and we clearly have the competence. We have the comfort with knowing what we're doing every single day, especially as it's showing up in the pandemic work of what we did. And we have integrity. And we need to make sure we continue those things while also learning from these other disruptors about how do you make it seamless and easy and using that data in a trustful way to help them be healthier. So let me um, add on to that question and anyone just pipe up. You know, this is this has appeared in the market as um, primary care, urgent care, um, niche services, which Terica was sharing with me earlier today in one of their markets, they have a provider that has just completely focused on OB care in all components and connecting that even to hospitals for delivery um, and, and making that a very narrow network. Where do you see that goes next? Because we, we've really struggled and discussed, okay, you're providing a primary care visit, you detect a problem, then what are you gonna do? Where's that patient gonna go? Go ahead. Please. I, I think that's the big question. When um, I think there's transactional relationships and then there's the long-term relationships. And sometimes you need a transactional relationship and so you don't need to go anywhere else. But sometimes you do need that long-term relationship that someone can take the time and look at your whole health journey and your whole health record and understand how those all come together. And I don't think that they're really ready for that yet. Uh, again, you look at the numbers, many people probably just need a transactional um, to start with, but it will evolve into that relationship piece. And that's where I do think we need to be there and ready to partner, um, because I think that there's uh, room enough for everybody that we need to identify how do we work together so that we can move those transactional relationships into transformational and really strong long-term relationships. Stephen, yeah. you were going to... Yeah, I think my thoughts kind of tied to Tina's, <clears throat> which is common. Uh, I'm a cancer surgeon, I like to say, by birth. So it, it was a, uh, took me a long time to really understand primary care. But I think what <laughs> I now realize is that there's no such thing as, quote, primary care. You know, for my mother, primary care means someone who comes to her assisted living and actually does work. For my children, it's someone that basically they can uh, episodically get to, to, you know, I need a prescription for my sinusitis. So, so primary care across the spectrum just is a number of different things and that um, for those little pieces that can be pulled off by the disruptors, I think we're gonna probably accept some of that's gonna happen. But to Tina's point, when you have a real health problem or you have a real health question or concern, you need somebody that you can trust to the degree that, that she referred to. That's where I think that our strength is, as long as we don't try to pretend that we're gonna be those little point solutions, but we are gonna be the people who you are gonna be here and you can trust throughout the continuum of your life. That's the thing I think we shouldn't lose track of. Yeah. So what do you all think um, about how we, as a healthcare field, can use our expertise in care delivery and the broad spectrum of services we provide um, and with consumer-oriented practices actually improve our position in the market? You know, I, I would just say that learning from these disruptors is important, but at the core of what we do and have been doing for hundreds of years is the fact that we take care of, of patients and every aspect of their life. And so making sure that we continue to provide that, that accessibility, while making it easy to use, while ensuring that we also are keeping our eyes towards the future, right? If, if we notice, first and foremost, uh, changes in demographics, uh, the needs changing, the, the, the wants changing, how are we responding to that? That's the secret sauce. And the health systems of the future will be those that are nimble enough to address their patient populations and their needs in a very quick manner with a level of competency that those niche providers just cannot do. One of the things I love about our field is that we are mission focused and we take care of all. And I think that's really important and we should have even more pride in our communities about how we take care of all. And I think it's along that care continuum, but our role is to take care of the community and to figure out how we can improve not only the individual's health, but the, the community's population health for it. And I think that takes a lot of time and energy and trust to do so, and partnerships with others uh, as we move forward. But that's just a critical role that we play as, as members, and I'm very proud of all of our healthcare organizations that do that every single day. So, you know, embedded within this topic 
is the work that health systems are doing around digital transformation, utilizing digital technology. Um, but to the point, we, we have in the past been very paternalistic. And so can we trust the patient to go online and make a specialty visit appointment? Or, or do we trust them to contact primary care directly through our portals? And, and how far can we go with that? Because using that digital technology, um, all the way through from appointment to arrival to registration, having that all done and then they arrive can make a huge difference in, in eliminating quite a bit of this friction. Um, just interested in any one of you, what you think of where you may be in that journey and do you think we will get there? Well, I can tell you, we're not far enough, clearly, but we absolutely will get there. And I think the word paternalistic is really a, a, a very pertinent word to this discussion. I often will have with some of our clinicians talk about we can never have our patients enter their own data into the electronic medical record. So you think you can take the patient's own information and get it down more accurately than the patient possibly could? I don't quite see it that way. So I think we've got to give some of that up and then have human oversight to that. It's no different than the explosion in generative AI right now. I mean, which, you know, if you're not, uh, I hope everyone here is already deeply involved in that because if not, you're missing the boat. But, but with that, it's not that it's going to do any of the work. If there's not a human being in almost any of that that goes on, we won't accomplish the, the value and, and bad things will happen, but whether it be patient internet data or patient scheduling appointments or, or uh, generative AI develop, you know, delivering, excuse me, creating the electronic medical record with all of those, there's still a human being that's gonna have to be that, and that's what we as the health systems mm -hmm. can be. When you look at the technology companies, they don't have anyone out there who can or, or wants or, or will do that. I think you said a really important point about um, trust and partnership with the people that we're serving. Um, so I think before, um, several years ago, we, we might not have done that. And now we're changing that and we're saying, uh, you know, many conversations about getting the lab results or imaging results out to patients within 24 hours. You know, sometimes people would say, no, 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 I need to review that before. And we're saying, no, the patients want it. They shouldn't have to wait for you to review something. And so it's going out there. We're um, actually transforming our entire scheduling process and making it seamless so that patients can schedule in any um, specialty area as well as imaging and other modalities. It's a long process to change our current practices and talk to each of our clinics to do that, but we've already done that for primary care, women's health, endoscopy, and a, co and a couple other areas. And the, the engagement by our consumers has been phenomenal to see them really love the fact that we are allowing them to do that and we're partnering with them on those processes. And so I think we need to do more of that. It includes communication, transparent communication, but also truly being a partner in someone's health. So now, now we're going into the bonus round here with the million dollar question. And we'll start on the far end this time with Terica. But what, what we want to know is going forward, how will the retail revolution change care delivery by 2030? And how will that impact hospitals and health systems? What will we be doing differently than we do today? And I think we've talked a lot about pieces of this, but as we move forward to the future, the digital interface within our systems, how we have that woven throughout is going to be just basic table stakes. I do believe that all these digital pieces that we're trying to make the system easier to use, not only in the ambulatory environment, but also in the hospital and having the patients be owners of their care owners of their data, owners of their health, uh, that is going to be our norm. And releasing control, releasing control of the oversight, as we mentioned about, you know, oversight of care and oversight of data of, of the patient. That's a very important piece. The last thing I would just say, too, is that we talk a lot about hospitals, the four walls of hospitals, but as we look to towards 2030, a lot of this care is going to be delivered 
outside of those four walls. And so health systems that will be around will be those that embrace the fact that our connectivity to our patients is going to go far beyond them walking out of our doors. And so whether that's remote patient monitoring, whether that is concierge sort of interfacing electronically via chat <laughs> uh, AI, whether that is a level of interface that we perhaps don't have today, it will exist in an effort to have connectivity to our patients long before they come to the four walls of the inpatient setting. All right, Steve, in your turn. I would tie one, you know, you have both the technology and the people. And if you think about the way that, that Terika just described right there, uh, for us to think that we could have someone who would follow all the remote patient data is impossible. But for have to, us to have technology that can help us do that and then a human intervene at the right point, that's, I think, really going to be wh where, where I would see that, that actually happening there. And, and it goes back to what Tina was talking about. You know, you have, the technology is actually not that hard. You have a whole bunch of programs that could do it. It's the human component in tying that to it and mm -hmm. us being humble enough to allow ourselves to, to lean into that. But I, I think you're absolutely right. Digital will be cast through everything we're doing in 2030. It's just inevitable. Care will be delivered everywhere and anywhere that you want it to be. And um, I think the biggest thing we have is some expertise of our outcomes and what we're really focusing on. And we need to make sure that it's simple, that it's personalized, and we maintain that trust. And we need to be willing to do some things that are different than today, um, to try some things, to challenge the status quo and be innovative so that we can make sure that we are still a, a strong partner for the people that we serve. So I'm going to go back to Tina, because um, earlier today we were doing a little brainstorming about what, what, not worst case, but what would be the ultimate evolution of this model. And so do you see the potential for a CVS, a Walgreens, a tech company, and Amazon to decide, all right, we're going to partner with a, an insurance company. We're going to become a low-cost provider. We're, maybe we're gonna buy a hospital, mm -hmm. or maybe we're gonna build a hospital that's based on best practices. They don't want their money tied up in that. However, <laughs> there are, that could go a lot farther than what we've already discussed, couldn't it? Yeah, I think there could be a lot of um, advancement when we talk about the premium dollar. Everyone's gonna go after the premium dollar. So when you have a health plan or the conversation, um, you're looking at value-based care. And I do think that is the transition to get to more value-based care because people want it to be affordable. Um, so as you think about a CVS, as an example, having Aetna, they're going to continue to keep care within their own area, four walls or, you know, not literal four walls, because then they can manage that premium dollar in a much better way. The interesting thing will be how can they manage consumer behavior and health behavior, and how can they manage choice? Because... All of us still want choice. And that's what we navigate every single day is, is how do you change that behavior and how do you do choice? So you gotta give choice and access and processes. But if you want affordability, we will have to start changing some of that right now. And I think that's where we will see more models on this value-based care model. We've been implementing some value-based care clinics um, within the partnership between our health plan and our care delivery. And we've seen really good success in it, but it requires a lot of change and some things that you haven't, we haven't done before. One of the examples is we put a um, blue R on everybody that's in a risk relationship. It means you're going to treat people differently because you're at risk for that. You still get the same high quality care, the outcomes are still there, but the services that wrap around that to keep them out of the hospital, to keep them out of an emergency room is much different than what you may be doing for somebody that you're not in a risk-based relationship on. And so it's that thinking that as you expand to more uh, focus on that premium dollar, that's gonna permeate through everything that we do and it will change how we navigate and how we use different, different um, parts of the health system. So devi deviating a little bit from our current topic, but you brought it up and it ties into this very much so. Um, the AHA Board of Trustees is engaged in a conversation about what are the future models of care provision. Um, and pretty much now our country is in this fee-for-service model, which means I provide services, your insurance company pays me. Um, I provide services, I get paid. There's not a lot of risk there, there's not much accountability for the outcome, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
there's the potential that we could find ourselves with government payers being asked to move to what's called a t um, total cost of care model, meaning you're going to get paid X to manage this population. Under that kind of model, then potentially we see some of those dollars actually going toward preventive care and wellness care. The fee-for-service model hasn't done that. So just off the top of your heads, um, we've talked about numerous models. Um, Tina's actually leading a group looking at models. We don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. But do you all think that our field is going to have to transform into a more value-based, risk-based, cost-constrained model um, to get the efficiencies we need? I've been looking at those models since uh, John asked me to lead the task force on it. And, uh, <laughs> and um, one of the things I've also been looking at is what else, what other transformational things have gone on in our world? And you think about other things, you know, we, we you know, film the digital. Um, you think about that. We, we, we now do our shopping online. We've, there's so many things that we have just now become part of who we are in, in this world. I live in Michigan, so we're going from um, the, the cars are changing uh, significantly, and you're setting up the infrastructure. So I think for healthcare, we need to move from um, uh, treatment to health, and that's going to take some time because you need the infrastructure, just like we need in the mobility section of how do we get there. And so it's one that um, we're taking some time to figure out what are those models. It's probably still some current models that exist today that have tweaks to it, some innovation to it, but then there's probably other ones that really do focus on that health and align the incentives so that we're focused on a person's health for the long term. I would just add to that too, you know, the very important piece about aligning the incentives. That is the missing piece, I do believe, uh, from us transitioning from this sick care system that we are currently in to the wellness and sort of holistic being and, and the whole person health. And so that piece is critical and that comes with aligning payment structures. That comes with aligning how uh, our providers, our hospitals, our entire ecosystem uh, is ultimately paid. And, and focusing in on well-being will be an outcome in many regards of that payment structure. Because the payment structures, uh, it's the elephant in the room. And I forgot who was attributed to the, the old quote of, it's hard for to get someone to understand something if their salary depends on not understanding it. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 you know, what I'll tell you is that, that there are so many incentives for things to not have these things happen, whether it be, you know, physicians are incented, don't treat two conditions on the same day because you only get paid for one of them. Well, that's, you know. You can say maybe is a good idea, but you know what happens? There are lots of physicians, I'm sorry to say, who will say, I'm not going to treat that today. You can come back tomorrow and I'll, I'll do that. And there's a thousand other examples. But if we don't take on that elephant in the room yeah. and pretend that it's not there, we can wish all day long. It's only going to happen when we actually change some of those fundamental okay. issues. So we figure within six months, Tina will have all those answers <laughs> and we'll, we, we will reform the national health system as we know it. Um, she could do it, but she's got another job to do. Um, so um, any closing remarks before we open up for questions around this topic? I, I think the, um, there's a lot of innovation going on in our healthcare systems. I am really proud of the things I see within our system and, and with my peers and the people I've talked to about what they're trying to do to be more seamless, more simple, more effective at what we do, and really address the affordability across, across it. So I think we need to make sure we don't get too down on ourselves for that, but that we should embrace the opportunity and the accountability to make it even better. I think a critical part of this is listening and really listening to the people that we serve every single day to ensure what they want we are actually delivering on. Yeah, I think it's also to take a step back and, you know, how are we really doing? You know, when COVID hit, I think we really saw that the health systems are the de facto public health system in the country. You can hope that it's government. You can hope that it's whatever. You know, we kind of showed up. And when other people were watching Netflix, you know, every single system in the country, even ones that we might have thought, okay, if there's a bell curve, that one may not, hello, they still did exactly that. So I think we ought to just kind of recognize the health systems are still there. And regardless of what disruptors come through, regardless of what regulatory and payment changes come through, the health systems are actually still taking care of us. 
Great points. I would also just echo that uh, over the last few years, we've been looking at also disrupting ourselves. And that means even in the four walls of the hospital. So why do I need to have a caregiver come in every hour to check you in the middle of the night for your temperature and, and, and vitals? Why couldn't that not be an electronic solution? So we deployed electronic solutions to help uh, with, with monitoring, right? We, We've instituted virtual nursing in our, in our health systems to be able to address some of the nursing shortages. So that internal disruption, uh, I do not think it gets enough light. It's how we also innovate uh, this incumbent system uh, that's been around for a very long time uh, to make sure that we're meeting the needs of our patients inside of the hospital and also external too. So with that, we would love to open it up to questions. Yes, ma'am. Striped, like my stripe. <laughs> you, yes. Hi. Um, I, it's on. Um, I'm a physician hospitalist, and I, uh, shout out to Grady, did some rotations there in med school. Um, <laughs> I, I have colleagues who would argue that there's no such thing as sort of value-based care. Um, that even the Intermountains, the Geisingers, or fee-for-service chassis on which there are some value-based contracts but in order to truly have a value-based care that incentivizes health and wellness, it's more than maybe an R on a chart and more about a paradigm shift in how we treat and care for people. As you think about that, as you have an asset that's a PL hospital, as you think about that shift in your system, what does that take? What is that gonna be for you? What does that look like? Is it a, a, a dramatic thing? How do you go from being dependent on that, as you're describing, Tarka, the sick care, to being coming a system of health, wellness, and prevention? Is it gonna be some dramatic thing? Or how do we get from being something that's probably not really value-based in our minds, right? And to being something that is really, truly outcomes-driven and wellness-dependent for our people? Madam Chair. I, I, I think it's, so I, I, I think you're right. You gotta separate the value-based care and, and you can't do value-based care for the first hour and then fee-for-service. And so we've separated it out and because we tried to do it in both and you just can't do that. So it's separated out, it's kind of its own area and we've been innovating in that. And we're actually trying some other cool things there. Like we hired a cardiologist to just see the value-based. They're not in the cath lab. They're not generating revenue, but we're paying them to be there to answer all the questions from this value-based clinic and process. And so we're trying to really be innovative and think about that process, but it's a separate kind of thing in our system to see how do we do that. I do think you're probably always going to have some sort of fee-for-service because uh, it's going to be transactional care that comes in, but how do we really shift this to be focused on health? And the big area is uh, consu consumer behavior. And we have lifestyle medicine programs. We've been doing a lot there to help, but it's a, it's a journey that is gonna take us a lot of years to get there to really help get people along that lifestyle medicine well-being process to really see the benefit of doing that. But your question is the right question, and how to get there is going to be difficult at best. Yeah, because I, I can imagine the, <clears throat> the end state actually is not hard for me to envision an ideal end state, which would be total cost of care. You mm -hmm. know, if you take, um, a health system that has whatever revenues, 20, 20 billion, a large health system. I bet that they would in a minute say, give me 80% of that, but I don't have to do all the wasted documentation that you know you spend your day or your night doing, and I don't have to fill out the forms and I have to get pre-auth and, and all that stuff. I think you could cut 20% out of the cost overnight if you did that, but how you get to that from where we are is the part that none, no one's figured out yet. Yes, man, right here. digital systems for communications, record keeping, et cetera. Where I see the big gap, and I don't know where hospitals play this role because there's a huge move to drive care out of the hospitals because it's so expensive to provide the care into the home. So we have digital monitoring, et cetera, which can take place. But there's no place in the home to put those records and make it easy to put those records. So that's a problem for the entire healthcare system. Mm -hmm. But right now, we learned how to pump our gas 
We learned how to bag our own groceries. We care for ourselves in our homes. <laughs> so, yeah. And that's going to happen increasingly. Yeah. Yeah. So I just, it's a problem, Great. and it's, uh, I don't know who develops that whole, the holistic system. Mm -hmm. I love what you just said in terms of the notion that we've been providing care in the homes, we've been, we've been working in d different settings for a very long time and enabling and empowering our patients to feel comfortable doing that. That is ultimately where we're heading, absolutely. I do caution us though that there has to be a quarterback. Every great team, right, you can have great wide receivers and you can great, have great uh, defensive linemen, but there has to be a quarterback still. And so maybe still we have to think through whether that's the, our electronic me medical records, whether that's your primary care provider, there has to be a centralized place, someone to help direct and support that care, whether it be in the home, whether it be in an ambulatory clinic, or whether it's, it's at a Walgreens. You know, it, it has to be somewhere where that's ultimately cent centralized. Yes, right here. Hi, uh, so. Hi, my name is Kwame Liddell. I'm the founder and CEO of Nutrable. We provide chronic care management in non-healthcare settings, like schools and community organizations. And But before that, I was an ER nurse and a hospital administrator. And we're finding that when we work with, with organizations, we're oftentimes their first innovation that's coming into the system. Mm -hmm. And they're still learning. Luckily, I was an administrator because I'm working with them to learn how do you introduce these new tools? So I'd like to hear from you guys on some of the innovations you guys have brought into your systems and what does that process look like internally um, and how might that transform in the future? So I'm gonna take one of these. Um, so um, Grady is a big giant safety net institution in a state that has not expanded Medicaid. And so 40% of the patients that we provide care to have no form of payment whatsoever no insurance, no nothing. And so in a way, we really are in a total cost of care model because it behooves us to put every type of measure in place we can to make sure we improve health and, and eliminate readmissions or the need to ever come and be admitted to the hospital. And so we are using AI, um, an AI engine that takes a social determinant of health inventory that we do on our patients every year takes their most recent clinical data, takes their pharmaceutical records, and through its billions of iterations, every day publishes for each of our primary care providers in our neighborhood centers, their patients that are most at risk. We then use mobile health teams to go to those patients' homes to validate what we're seeing in, in that report. And so our work there is reduce readmissions, improve health. How do, how, do we get, how do we avoid getting to the chronic disease at the in the first place? Um, got a call the other day from a friend whose 41-year-old brother was in congestive heart failure, um, blood pressure out of control, had been prescribed blood pressure medication, but just didn't take it for some nu numerous cultural reasons, to be honest. Um, so how do we put that into the whole system? But here again, What's that path, you know? So we'll go to the back, all the way to the back there. Uh, Ryan Cotton, I'm a physician uh, based in LA and, and Aspen. I have a concierge practice, and in, in our practice, we have the time and luxury to spend a lot more digging into the health records and, and combing it. That's not something we can do for everyone. On, a, on the level of scale, my concern is the integrity of data in our healthcare systems. So, Tarika, you had mentioned the, the idea of, of having a home for, for this data where the quarterback and the, the calling the quarterback the EMR system or something of that sort. My, my great concern is that, especially as we are now having artificial intelligence, we are perpetuating and growing data and it's like stamp and repeat. We're copying the, 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 the vomited verbiage in a patient's chart from doctor to doctor to doctor to doctor. And if, if you actually look at the charts, I would say 80% of patients' charts are complete wrong. And, and that's either because of the beneficence of a phenomenal physician that is fudging the data to qualify the patient they want to help to get a drug that they know they need to get. So they're giving them a diagnosis that's actually inaccurate, and they have to push a button to move forward in the EMR charts. They can't close the notes. 
unless they push a button. So they're forced into a box to choose something that's inaccurate that then gets propagated for a decade. So if we're thinking about actually giving autonomy to patients and empowering them to actually be in control of their own medical records, what ideas do, do you guys have in terms of how hospital systems, because data lives in the hospital systems, no matter how many private doctors they see or uh, other healthcare places they get in the consumer world to get care, none of those places are tracking the, the data the way the hospital is and taking that responsibility for community. How is it that we, we in the hospital system, can actually clean the data to make sure that the, the data has integrity before it gets duplicated elsewhere? I, I would throw a couple things in. One, one is that I would advocate two things. One is that this is a place where I believe Gen AI can be miraculous because it can take that whole morass of things that's in electronic medical records and bring it into a summary that will, with a human being touching, you know, checking on it, can get back to where we actually just have useful data. Number two is that I would be strongly advocate that those data be available to appropriately filter by the patient, of course, to everybody, not just the hospital, not just the home health agency, but to everybody. But the patient obviously will have to control who has that. But I think we can fix that almost overnight if we're willing to let Gen AI actually take all that morass of junk and put it into something usable. Yes, back there. Hi, I'm Jackie Gerhardt. I'm a physician at Epic. I'm a family medicine physician. Uh -huh. I'd love to respond to your question. <laughs> <laughs> I saw your hand go up, and I'm I was like, like me, there's a connection. Pick me. <laughs> so I completely agree with the idea of generative AI. We've been working a lot on that in the electronic medical record, not only from an in-basket perspective, but also from a curation and truth-building perspective. So how is it that we use tools, not just a human's brain, to curate through all the different notes that may or may not be true to actually find out what the source of truth is? And it actually goes back to the patient. So on the spectrum, as we're thinking about this from a medical record perspective, on one end of the spectrum, there's my chart, which is Epic's made patient portal, where patients can ask questions that they have, write in their information, write in their goals, write in their preferences, and so forth, and just have them, their own family members and them manage their care. And then all on the way, other side of the spectrum is the data that you get in hospital from like an acute encounter. There's a whole lot of stuff in the middle that is part of your record or that you can choose to have be part of your record that really will advance your health that doesn't need to be just at home or just acute. It can be where you have a monitor and alert strategy where maybe as one of your predictive risk scores goes up and you notice, hey, you're now above a score of a 20, we should definitely send somebody to your home. Uh, it could be a AI model that figures out what's your likelihood that you are going to deteriorate in the hospital and it keeps you from getting into the hospital in the first place because you see that, again, the score going higher and you send out appropriate uh, therapy. So it's, to me, when you think about having a quarterback, I still think it's the patient and the um, sort of patient's care system around them that really is the quarterback. It's just what tools are you using to empower that person where they are and make the healthcare system come to them while still knowing there's a spectrum of care from at their home to in the hospital. All the way over here. insurance companies are pulling in the party, or the cardiology outset uh, center in Texas who's going to do a, um, uh, give me a pacemaker for $5,000 versus $15,000. Why aren't you guys blowing up your business models? Why aren't you hiring McKinsey and Bain and saying, what's our edge? Your edge should be, I think, you own the client. But you're not doing a great job around the client because I think if everybody raised their hand in the room and say, are they frustrated with the client service aspect of hospitals and healthcare, I think most people would raise their hand. So it seems to me that that, that and the frustration that people have around because I'll get an MRI here, I'll go to here, and you know, they'll say, well, you gotta send a fax. 
who sends faxes anymore, okay? It's just the stuff that goes on is crazy. So my question is, why don't you just hire, each of you hire five 30-year-olds that are entrepreneurs, that just have an entrepreneur, that have no affiliation to trying to defend the mountain, mm -hmm. but want to take the mountain. Because you have embedded power in your systems, but you're yesterday, you know? So how are you gonna, why don't you just blow up your models? Can I start maybe? Uh, one of the things that we, first of all, thank you. Uh, <laughs> One of the things that we, we've been doing is we've created a design studio. Essentially, we hired the 30-year-olds uh, to identify the problems, the friction, the places of greatest resistance, areas of opportunity. Uh, and they are working to help us with digital solutions. So that's our build sort of environment. I do want to underscore the one thing. Our regulatory environment is not ripe for self-disruption. I'll give you a perfect example. So we instituted a wearable within the hospitals, within our acute areas, that allows for continuous monitoring, but also it takes all of your vitals. And there's about 17, 18 discrete different types of vitals that it can take. The FDA only approved three of the 17 or 18. Um, and then when we were surveyed by our, our external agencies, I spent a half a day having to explain how we were keeping these, the information safe. And there, there was a tremendous amount of friction around this. Whereas a provider that's a niche provider, they don't have to have the same level of regulatory compliance that we do. And so th there are limitations that to what we're able to do or what the parameters that's been put onto us, but that's not because we don't want to. Believe me, I think every one of us on this, on this panel will tell you we've been trying to disrupt ourselves for a very long yeah. time. No, and your point's well taken. Unfortunately, I'm getting this. <laughs> <laughs> and they may, they may throw me out if we don't, but we will stay up here. Yes. We'll stay up here as long as you all want to chat until the next Thank session. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.